Five years ago, I found the six bolt short block full of broken glass and BBs in a garage that was waist deep in garbage. The place was doubling as a makeshift drunken firing range and a personal landfill. I was digging out a free 1992 all wheel drive Eclipse with 158,000 miles. The engine was reassembled incorrectly after a new head gasket installed and the head got trashed on the first rotation. So that's where I got the free all wheel drive drivetrain for the Colt. I'm not exactly a pack rat, but when I see something like this with inevitable value, I tend to hoard. I've made 130 videos grinding and cutting next to this thing without being careful, so add sawdust and metal shavings and grinding wheel dust to the glass and BBs mix. It's filthy, it's going to get tanked, but before I spend any money doing that, I want to check it to see what I've got. I think this is a virgin block. Probably never been machined and still has all of its OE parts, or it did when I originally started taking it apart. Balance shafts and everything. It's clearly been abused and poorly maintained, so this might be the perfect candidate to illustrate what to look for. When the rings are dry like these, there's a potential for the bores to get scratched, so I'm oiling them to prevent damaging anything during disassembly. That's top dead center, give or take a degree. If the head's off, there's no need to keep it that way, but you need number one all the way at the top of the bore like this when putting the motor back in correct time. I've already got the oil pan off and there's no front case on this thing, but let's see what's inside. The timing side is the front of the block. The main bearing caps have arrows cast into them. They always point to the front of the motor. Numbers 1 and 2 and 4 and 5 are also cast to indicate front and rear. The center cap is where the main thrust bearing lives. Seven bolt engines have a girdle that connects all of the mains so you can't get them mixed up. It's a great design, it's very strong, but the thrust bearing used in a seven bolt, nah, not so much. There are ten bolts for the mains. Number two has a stud for the oil pickup to bolt to. If you look below the crank, you'll see this is a turbo six bolt because it has oil squirters. We'll get a better look at those in a later video because they have to come out prior to machining. Since this block is horribly varnished, actually it looks more like tar, it shows the owner didn't follow a timely maintenance schedule and may have even had AGR issues. This thing stank nasty. I expect to find wide oil clearances and worn bearings in here, so that's what I'm going to look for first. This is what I call a junkyard inspection because I'm not using precision tools for the quick check. If the crank in play is loose like this, you can feel the crank rattle around. You want the rods to all be loose, but the crank not so much. If a rod is tight, it may be seized or spun. You may not be able to turn the crank if that's the case, and in a junkyard, you should pass that one by and move on. Save yourself the time and trouble. This feels a little loose to me, so let's move on and measure what the end play really is. There's a couple of ways to do this. This is called a digital indicator. It's similar to the dial gauge in the previous video, but it's digital and it only measures to a half thousand. You use these to measure run out, in play, step height, etc. The plunger of the dial gauge is spring loaded to ensure it always makes contact. The idea is to get the indicator set up so that the plunger moves parallel with whatever you're measuring and from a fraction of an inch into its range. These things aren't accurate if you zero them at the end of their reach. It's best to use one of these cool magnetic bases that are great for trolling five and six year olds. It has an on off switch that actuates a 45 pound magnetic base. You let them pick it up first and get a feel for it, then flip the switch. Suddenly it becomes heavier than a meteor or two and they can't pick it up. Flip the switch off and they can lift it again. It's handy because you can mount it to iron or steel at any angle. Once it's in position and the crank's at the end of its travel, use a small pry bar or a big screwdriver. Don't go nuts putting excessive pressure on your mains. You just want to pry it lightly to the end of its thrust clearance. With everything in place and the plunger touching the crank, zero the indicator. Now move the crank forward and take your measurement. Move the crank backward again and make sure the tool zeroes. Take this measurement several times just to make sure it's working properly and compare the results to your engine specified crankshaft thrust clearance. That's your in play measurement. For both the turbo 6 bolts and the 7 bolt 4G63, in play specification is between 2 thousandths and 7 thousandths of an inch. And this one's right there at the end. For those of you using metric tools for measurement, the specification is between 5 and 18 hundredths of a millimeter. You should rotate the crankshaft 180 degrees and repeat this test to make sure that your crank is straight. If you get different measurements at that point, you'll probably need to get the block align board and really scrutinize the crank to ensure it isn't bent. I thought it felt a little loose. You want that as close to the narrow spec as you can get it. Apparently my Jaffro junkyard skills are still pretty well honed. Some of you don't have a dial indicator or a digital indicator. It's okay, there's another way for you to test this. It's not nearly as easy, but almost as accurate. You can measure the thrust clearance at the main bearing journal with a feeler gauge. The process is the same with moving the crank back and forth. Check the loose side and see which feeler gauge fits. Don't force a feeler gauge into the gap. 
Since I was able to measure .0065 with the digital indicator, I'm starting with the .006 feeler gauge. Make sure you're applying even but light pressure to the crank while you're noodling around or else you won't get a good measurement. This one slides right in, so I'm stepping up to the 7,000th. It should slip in without fighting you if it's the right one. Hmm. This one fits as well. I think it's just got some dirt in it. Let me check the digital indicator again. Feeler gauges are not as accurate as a digital indicator, but they're still very effective and can give a good approximation of what your thrust clearance is. Apparently they work pretty well for cleaning dirt out of a bearing like I just did, but they're really messy if the engine's still in the car. Laying under a car with no oil pan is not fun, trust me. The dial indicator is much better suited for that kind of job, but that's how you measure your thrust clearance.